Hello and welcome to the York Creators Podcast. My name is Ben Porter and each week you can join me as I chat to someone from York's creative community. This week's guest is Kit Monkman. Kit is a leading and prolific innovator across screen-based art and interactive media. He directed the visually experimental UK feature Macbeth in 2018, described by Peter Holland, the chair of the International Shakespeare Association, as the most innovative rethinking of what it means to put Shakespeare on film for decades. As a founder of KMA, Kit has also worked as an installation artist in the interactive public realm, creating works that have dramatically transformed many iconic spaces, and as a theatre and show designer, he's worked with artists as diverse as Prince and DV8. In this episode, we chat about some of Kit's early work and the role of technology and creativity. We discuss the increasingly interconnected relationship between all art forms and how those relationships can be used to blend the boundaries between artist, subject, and audience. Kit, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. So it's good to have you on, and I'm aware that we were originally going to chat as part of the first series, so thank you for waiting patiently for two years to come and have a chat. Um, I've got lots of questions I want to ask you, but before I get into it, um, recently had Katie McCabe on the podcast, mm. and she gave me a question to ask you. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and what she wanted to know was, what do you think is a perfect way to um, remember people's lives? Oh, my God. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. Um, Which is not an easy question. What's a perfect way to remember people's lives? So we are. Spe- she's or to memorialize. Might memorialize have been the right word. Lives. Well, I'm sure there is not a perfect way to do it because it's so. Um, just as every individual is specific, so I guess every memory is specific, and every recollection of each person. So I'm kind of hedging my bets here, but you know, is that kind of famous quote, isn't it? So famous, I can't remember who said it, but you know, essentially that you know. We don't die until the last person speaks our name. And so it's clearly just the, the very act of remembering, I think, is an act of kind of memorialising and and a kind of immortalising to some extent. Um, but, you know, I, I guess it's like living your life, isn't it? I mean, I think do it with empathy. You know, if you can imagine a little about what it must be like to be somebody else, then you're halfway there. I mean, that's the, the big battle for all of us throughout our lives, isn't it? It's trying to bridge that kind of gap between the lives that we lead inside our own skulls and the sense that we also are deeply aware that we're part of one of the most social species on the mm. planet you know it's a kind of weird human dichotomy yeah so i think perhaps what she was maybe trying to get at, um <laughs> which no you, you did answer yeah. it was um we had a conversation about uh, taking photographs because obviously yeah. this whole thing um, is filmed fine. and she mentioned that you'd had a, a conversation about um you know, when not to take photographs and when to take photographs and trying to yeah. manage that whole thing? Yeah, well, I'm always, I mean, I've always been intrigued by photography. I mean, partly because I, the, I love, I love it. And partly because I've always been really wary of it. And I think when I was a teenager, I had this mad theory, which was that, that I felt that somehow by taking photographs, you implanted a kind of a false memory of, of your own life. And so for about, 20 years in fact until, until I had kids I didn't take any photographs which I now bitterly regret um, so, but but I have very little memory as well so it's completely backfired um, but but I kind of slightly understand what I was thinking and I mean it is interesting isn't it that we don't on the whole we don't photograph funerals and we don't you know, we kind of choose the moments we photograph and we tend to photograph things that we conceive of as being happy shared moments we don't you know, if your child is having a massive tantrum, you don't tend to thrust the camera into its face and say, I just want to remember this moment. Mm. So I'm all kind of intrigued by what we do and don't choose to remember and, and how photography kind of is is a big intervention into that. And also, I think, you know, the other thing that I, I feel very strongly as I get older, I suppose, is that we are beginning to give over our sense of reality to the lens. You know, that if something hasn't been filmed or isn't, isn't on television or isn't on an iPhone or isn't sort of not somehow real. And, and I think that's particularly odd given the fact that of course the lens is just another mad representation. You know, it's, it's, it's an analog of the world and, you know, like old Hockney's kind of, you know, those kind of fractured photographs, you know, he's deeply aware that that's not how we see the world. We don't see the world through a single lens. We see it in this kind of, you know, I'm talking to you. I look at my pans. I look at my feet. I look at you, you know, it's a kind of succession of images um, and our lens-based culture is so based on this kind of idea that somehow, you know, we have a, a, a fixed position. And I don't know, I'm rambling a bit now, but, I, but you know, I, I, think, I think 
the 21st century is clearly, I mean, our culture is so predominantly visual. Mm. Um, but we're not very intelligent, I think, always about what that visual perspective is. And it's it seems to be so predominated by this idea of a fixed lens. And it's kind of people go to concerts, don't they? They don't actually experience the moment. They just record it. I mean, why? Nobody ever watches them. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> yeah, it's not the thing. It's like when when I do photography projects, I really enjoy the act of being there with either the person or the object that I'm photographing. Mm. Um, and it's a reason to go out and have an adventure or to stop and look at something that's beautiful. And at the end, you get this end product, which is a nice representation of the thing. But the, the photograph is not the thing. Yeah, it's just absolutely. It's just a memory of the sure. thing. Sure, sure. Um, so you came up with this theory when you were a teenager. Um, mm. What were you like as a teenager? And what did you want to, <laughs> what did you want to be when you grew up? <laughs> oh, my God. Um I well, I, did, I think I was probably deeply um, pompous and pretentious. <laughs> but were you making things at that point in your life? Yeah, yeah, no, I've always, always, absolutely, always. I was um, so. I mean, I'm kind of an age where, I guess, when I was a teenager, eight-bit computers were just kind of kicking off, and the first thing that computers kind of were able to really offer in the creative world, apart from obviously type. We had word processing and stuff was was music, so kind of early MIDI and even pre MIDI stuff on computers was something that really kind of engaged me. And so, yeah, I spent the first, I suppose, getting on for ten years of my kind of late teenage, early adult life writing music. And is that music still around for people to listen to, or is it hidden away? I, in the thank God, world? I think it's hidden away. I mean, <laughs> there, there was some of it was kind of um, you know commercial stuff, but it was you know on the, at the time there was a pretty grim sort of franchise called Transworld Sport that was just kind of sport from all over the world with lots of library music and I, you know, I did things for things like that but but now I think I think thankfully it's all hidden away <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, where were you at that point in your life where were you growing up was it in York or was it somewhere else or? well yes I mean so my I, you know I was born in London brought up in London and my my kind of experience of Yorkshire is is entirely accidental um because my parents, who both worked for the BBC, um, my dad was, he was an old dad, so he was like in his 50s when I was born. And my mum, clearly much younger. And my dad had kind of read, he actually was from Yorkshire, and he, in his 20s he'd read Tristram Shandy, you know, Lawrence Stern's kind of 18th century novel. And it just kind of changed his life. And so from then on he collected early editions of Stern and whilst he was working at the BBC and amassed what was pretty much the world's biggest library, I think, of Stern and early editions and prints and whatever. And then he and my mum came up to Yorkshire on a holiday in the early 60s and saw Shandy Hall, which is in Coxville, which is only kind of 18 miles north of York. And it was falling down. It was, it was just where Stern lived and wrote most of Tristram Shandy um, and Sentimental Journey. And my dad was a kind of, you know, he, he was lovely, but he wasn't a very practical man and he would have just shrugged his shoulders and gone back to London. But my mum, who was very much the driving force in the relationship, sort of said, no, 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 we've got to do something about this. And together they formed the trust and raised the money to restore the house and kind of open it to the public and put his collection in. So, you know, it's still there now. Um, though both of my parents are long dead. Wow, that's quite so, a story. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, so, so that, you know, so and then, you know, so I was, I was sort of found myself on a building site in Yorkshire. But it was the most exciting building site in one sense because, and one of the things my parents were very good at, I think, was that they kind of included us kids in all of the conversations. So, you know, in the evenings you'd have professors from America or whatever. And I mean, all the conversation clearly went way over my head. But it was just to be involved in it and to be aware of the kind of, you know, um, conversational and debate and sort of argument was, was kind of, I think, a real, I'm very grateful for having had that experience. So what would you say was your first like, major project which got people to know who you were? Well, I wouldn't say it <laughs> people to know who I was. But when I was a student, so I was at Exeter University, and Exeter has this kind of odd thing of having the Northcote Theatre, which is a kind of the, the town's professional theatre on the campus. But I, at the time, I was doing some commercial music, um, and I met a friend in my first year who was, and now we're talking about what? No, I mean, my first year at university was in 1983, so a long time ago. And he was doing kind of very early sort of commercials but based all using slide projection so you know if you didn't have a huge budget to do a commercial and you wanted to do something in between they they would 
just begun to have these kind of carousels of slides that could be controlled by a computer and synced to, by that stage to MIDI. So you could sort of get 25 frames a second out of these things, but only in very short bursts. Um, anyway, together we concocted this idea to do, I mean, so, so again, pompous, pretentious, whatever, but a kind of electronic ballet. And we managed to get enough funding to actually do it professionally, well, you know, semi-professionally. And uh, so we hired the Northcote for three nights and we got an Arts Council dancer in residence who was in the southwest at the time who choreographed the thing and we kind of pulled this slightly mad ballet together. So that was, and that, that, I was in 1985, so that was the kind of first experiment. Um, but it was a kind of mixed media thing that I think I've always been interested in ever since, really. And I've, looking back on it now, you know, I kind of lean much more towards the visual than the, the musical, really. So um, I was doing the wrong job. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's all part of experimenting, isn't it? No, completely. Like, Absolutely. Finding things out of the way. I started off with music. Yeah. That was when you played in a band, um, you know, toured in a van and that kind of typical thing. And it was only through doing that that I got into film and photography. Yeah. Completely. Just because we needed press shots and then we needed a music video. And it's like, well, We've not got any money to pay for it, so I'll do it. And then that led me down a whole new path towards yeah. all this stuff. Yes, exactly. And I think I mean, that's you know probably always been true, but it's it's never been more useful than it is now in the sense that you know, we're all looking at this kind of intermediate world in which you know, it's very, I mean, unless you're an absolute purist, you know, most disciplines now have kind of begun to merge with others. I mean, I've always had this slightly rubbish analogy, but I keep bringing it out and then bring it out again now. But... Which is that, I mean, so let's let's go back to, I don't know, 1985 when I did this thing. You know, if if you treat art forms as Alka-Seltzers, let's say, and you have a Sharpie, then you could quite clearly, you could have written on one, you could have written dance, maybe, and one you could have written music, and one you could have written TV, and, you know, so on and so on. And they were pretty much, that's pretty much what they were. But I think the last however many years, 30 years or so, have been like putting those Alka-Seltzers in water. And so now, although there are still, you know, we're into, in my analogy, we've been to sort of 30 seconds of the Alka-Seltzer's life. So you can still point to these masses that still are recognisably, very recognisably, you know, music and dance and theatre and television and film. But actually there's an awful lot more fizz now in between them. And these kind of forms are constantly changing and, you know, sort of into interconnecting with one another. And that's, that's the territory that excites me, I have to say. Mm. What do you think's caused that? Is it the internet? Because yeah, just as like I a mean, random I, guess. Like, yeah, I mean, I think technology has been the biggest driving force. But then obviously you get this really interesting feedback loop between technology and culture. So that, you know, I mean, one of the things I've been most interested in my my adult life really is this relationship between audience and performer and thing. So in a sense, I mean, you could argue that in, in the 20th century, in, in very simple terms, you know, it was normally a pretty linear process. You'd have an artist or a, you know, originator of an idea. They would then make a thing that got distributed. And then at the, the other end of the, the kind of line, there'd be an audience who, you know, to whom it was broadcast or it was put on the wall of some establishment building or whatever. But there was always an audience. And then the feedback loop was pretty kind of slow and probably not terribly strong in that, You'd get some critical feedback and whatever, and it'd eventually work its way back to the artist, and the process would go again. And I think what's so exciting about the 21st century is that that linear path has been completely triangulated, and in triangulated, being completely disrupted. And it's now increasingly hard sometimes to tell where the artist is and where the audience is and where the thing is, even. Um, and that's been predominantly, I think, down to technology, but now it's just culturally embedded. And so the questions that we ask ourselves culturally about all of those things. I think, stand aside from technology. And that I find really exciting. I think that, you know, Adam, the things that have happened in my lifetime within the area in which I work, I think that's what excites me most. Yeah, because it's also um, sped up the learning process as well, isn't it? If somebody now really wants to work out to make a poster, um, they can go on YouTube and there's tons of tutorials and then they can learn tiny bits of graphic design from the start, whereas maybe previously yeah, they completely. wouldn't have known where to even start with that. Okay, they could have got books and completely. things. Completely. But... And also they can they can find a route to an audience, you know, which, which again was, the, it was always, I mean, in in my kind of teenage years, I suppose, it was always the, the gatekeepers were controlled, you know, the the route of from any idea to an audience. And that is really broken down mm. massively now. Yeah. 
So tell me about Viridian then, because that was started with uh, graduates <laughs> from the University of York, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It was. And so Viridian is a visual effects company in York. We like to kind of describe it as the biggest visual effects company in the north of England, which I mean, yeah, may or may not be true, but it's certainly one of them. Um, and yeah, it kind of grew out of another sort of mad experiment, really, which was that I, I'd been involved accidentally or almost i'm talking about exactly this sort of thing about how the, the one technological idea or one creative idea leads to another i had done a kinetic dance piece um, with phoenix dance theater who are in leeds but this is now 2005 and at the time they had a artistic director called darshan singh Buller, who subsequently became a really good friend of mine and he was making really interesting work i thought and at the time i'd been making live kind of visuals for things like the Brit Awards and smash hits and pop shows and arena shows and stuff. And it was, you know, at the time it was really exciting, but actually was quite dull in the sense that the aesthetics were just, can we have it bigger and bolder and redder or whatever it was? And, you know, and, and technologically it was pretty much, we had, you know, amplitude and pitch as kind of inputs to a visual system and nothing else really. So we got, we were thinking we must be able to try and do something more exciting. So we, we ended up, approaching Phoenix saying, can we, you know, and showing them the work we'd done in the pop world. So we really wanted to do something in dance. We ended up making this piece called England, which was a kind of a whole dance piece set between a back drop and a front gauze, both of which were projected onto and at all times kind of very much in tune with the dancers. Um, it went to Sadler's Wells and, and got a really good reception. It was kind of a throwaway piece in many ways, but it just hit the right moment, I think. Um, anyhow, it's a number of people saw it there who were kind of major um, contributors, I suppose, to our kind of the next stages of, of, of mine and KMA's creative development. But one of them was a commercials director um, who said, I want you to come and make commercials with me on green screen. And we kind of had no idea what green screen was. We knew what green screen was, but we didn't know any about it. This is about 2005. And we ended up doing a couple of commercials with him for, I mean, kids' TV, really. It was kind of, you know, um, not, not great stuff. Um, but as, as luck would have it, he just got his first feature film into production. It was quite a big budget thing in Shepparton. Tom Berenger and Jolie Richardson. It was a kind of kids, you know, um, Christmas movie. And he said, well, I want you guys to do the visual effects. And we kind of went, well, you know, we don't know. What, we don't even know what visual effects are, really. And we've just done these two commercials, but yeah. And he said, no, 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 I want you to do it. And we said, well, okay, great, fine. We'd love to do it if, if the producer will have it. And so we ended up being asked to do eight shots on this movie. And we went in and started. And they kind of really engaged with what we were trying to do. And eight shots became 80 shots, became 160 shots, became basically half the movie. And although it was lovely being on set, kind of going, oh, yeah, we can do that, we can do that, we can do that. You know, obviously it all came home to roost when we got back and went, oh, my God, you know. So I went to the university, and actually, I mean, this 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 really is a, a conversation of red herrings or whatever. But a few years earlier, I'd started with um, Charles Cecil and another chap called James Houston, a, a creative network in York called Creation, which was about two thousand. And in that, cemented some very fundamental friendships and connections for me. One of which was with the university. So I then went to the university based on those connections. Went to see John Matier and said, "Look, John, I kind of need some help." And he put me in touch with some students and we ultimately ended up making this film and it, it was what it was, but it was fine. And, and, and at the end of that process, we all disbanded. But in my mind, I'd kind of then got, got this bugger. I wanted to make a, a full 100% green screen movie. And uh, so we did that. And again, we, we, this time we hired a bunch of graduates from the university from scratch. And, and I think what was exciting, what's been exciting about that, I mean, we made, you know, we made lots of mistakes, let's be honest. And we, on the other hand, I mean, the, the, uh, the, 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 there was no possibility of us taking our idea to frame store or whatever. It would have cost, you know, hundreds of millions or whatever. And we just had no, no, no. so we kind of had to do it this way. But the, but the, the unforeseen benefit of it, and it really is, un was unforeseen, was that by engaging these kind of half a dozen, or maybe eight, young people in the whole filmmaking process so they were on set they were making decisions they were solving problems in a way that is completely foreign to the visual effects industry because normally that's it's a very hierarchical industry with 
you know, you go in the bottom, you make tea, and you kind of learn. We did it exactly the opposite way around, really. And and as a result, we've ended up with this team of people who are incredibly knowledgeable and whom directors now want to talk to because they can solve problems, you know. And so, you know, it actually really did work to our advantage. And we're now, when we visit Viridian, works on all sorts of feature films um, with all sorts of directors. And and it's the kind of problem-solving side of the company, I think, that, that really kind of sells us. And what's your role at Brilliant? What are you do, sort of doing day to day? Me? Mm-hmm. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm making, actually, right at the moment, I'm, I'm making a new piece called People We Love, which is going to be in York Minster for the whole of November as part of York Mediali, which itself has been kind of slightly coronavirus, as we all have. And has changed form and shape slightly, but touch wood, we are putting it on throughout November. Um, it's a piece which actually it's really interesting. Well, from my point of view, it's really interesting in the sense that it it ties into a lot of things we've talked about in this conversation. In that it's it's the first piece I've made that really isn't got it or hasn't got anything to do with technology. I mean, it's a it's a video art piece, so obviously it has got stuff to do with technology, but in a very simple way. Um, And yet it's completely informed by the ideas that I've discovered through working with technology. Um, And it's a piece that, that asks, well, so if you, if you were to walk into the Minster from the 2nd of November onwards, you'll see five life-size portraits on video. And each one is a, probably a York resident I think the majority of people are York residents who have involved and will be involved. And they're staring back at you. And they stare at you for maybe a couple of minutes. Um, and you kind of go, well, okay, well, what's so interesting about that? Um, and um, and maybe, <laughs> maybe not much, but I think there is, because the, one, the thing we framed the whole idea around is that we, when we were filming all these faces, and we will continue to film them throughout the run in the Minster, there'll be a booth in the Minster where you can add your face. We've asked people to come and bring in a picture of somebody they love, and they sit and look at it while we're filming them. And it's kind of Pepper's ghost, so they're actually staring straight at the image through into the lens. And we've got this kind of guided meditation, which just helps, I hope, people relax and then ask them some questions about the face that they're looking at. And it's completely silent in terms of what we're recording. We're not recording any audio at all. Um, so the, the person who walks into the Minster and sees these five s- sets of images is the only thing they know is that the people gazing back at them are looking at someone they love. They'll never know who that is. We, we don't even know who that is. We keep the whole idea of whose image it is completely secret, completely hidden. Um, but it's, it's the transaction that I'm interested in between the imagination of the viewer and the imagination of the viewed in such a way, and we talked earlier about where, where is the artist in this transaction, in such a way that actually, you know, it, it really, I think if you can create really meaningful transaction between this image and somebody looking at it, and I think, I think that's going to be possible, then well, who made that? Because I didn't make it. I mean, I might have had the original idea to bring these people together, but I didn't make that transaction at all. It's it's being made in the moment between the person who's looking and imagining the person who's looking back at them, who's also in their own head imagining something. And it's this kind of, you know, it goes back again to another thing we were talking about earlier, this beautiful thing I think about, you know, one of the, okay, so the Mona Lisa, why are we all so interested in the Mona Lisa as a, as a painting? You know, it's just, it's just a woman with a kind of smoky smile. And okay, it's beautifully rendered. And you know, I'm, I'm not for one moment suggesting that um, Leonardo is not a kind of ex- extraordinary, extraordinary painter. But, but I think what's so intriguing about it is, is that kind of perennial question of well, what's she thinking? What's going on behind those eyes? And it goes back to what we were saying right at the beginning about this idea that we are all stuck inside our own heads. And yet through empathy and imagination we're all trying to reach out and go i get you you know and this piece is really all about that and about you know if if that does result in a beautiful meaningful experience then who made it so was this a project <laughs> you pitched or was there a brief or yeah no i pitched it i kind of um i mean tom to be tom hyam at mediali had been had asked me a couple of times if i would do a kind of kma piece and kma's kind of the work that he was referring to really is that big, large, 
outdoor, very technological installations, but still playing with the same idea around performer and audience and who's who. And um, so similar thematically, but very, very different in terms of realization. Yeah. And we just would, you know, I said, I don't think it's kind of, I don't think it'd be a good idea to do a KMA piece because it just feels like you're kind of, you know, using the medialia just as a way of getting another workout into the world. And I felt that the stuff was getting a bit tired. But I did say, look, if ever I come up with something that I think might work, I'll, of course I'll tell you. So we did over several pints. Um, so do you have a process for coming up with ideas like this or do they just appear when you're not thinking about them? Well, yeah, no, I have. A, so I live, I mean, funny enough, I live out in Coxwold, which is you know, where I first came to Yorkshire. I'm back there again. And it's just underneath the, the moors. So it's near you know, the White Horse in Gilburn. It's the next door village. And my you know, my working practice is pretty much walking. I mean, I have a clockwork brain if I've got any kind of brain, and it you know it works best when my feet are in motion. And so, you know, I kind of I do I work when I know what I need to do at a desk. But when I don't know what to do and I need ideas, I walk and I just walk. So yeah, this was an idea that was sort of formed on a on a walk up the you know essentially up the White Horse or on those hills. Nice. So we're about to hit half an hour, so mm -hmm. I'm going to restart the cameras. But um, before we sign off, is there anything that um, you would like to talk about that I've not brought up? I mean, I, we could we could ramble for hours, I'm sure. But um, I think for me, in terms of the specifics of, of this podcast, I, it would be kind of remiss to finish without saying something about this place, you know, about York, I mean, which has really been the backdrop to my whole, well, creative and other life. Um, and I, I mean, I love it. And I think that it's one of the most extraordinary cities from a creative point of view. And I think one of the, you know, there are a few real advantages in getting longer and longer in the tooth. But one of them is, is kind of just witnessing, you know, new generations of creative, creativity kind of emerging from the same place. And um, I think there's something, I've always felt there's something about the scale of the city, that it's kind of just perfect. It's, it's a combination, it's, it's big enough to to kind of feel like it it has a mass but it's also small enough that you kind of can get to a point where you pretty much know everybody within it and can bounce off each other and each other's ideas and i also think there's something about you know and I, i'm i'm going to be rude about places like reading or swindon and i don't you know in, but but there's a kind of sense in which you know we live in a in an increasingly free prefabricated world and you know people increasingly have to work in spaces which feel pretty inhuman in many ways and i just think there's something lovely about york as a kind of every time you raise your eyes you see a reminder of previous generations and there's a kind of sense that human beings have been here for a long time and done things here for a long time and that things still speak to us and that we can therefore do things that speak to future gener generations too and i just think i mean there's something beautiful about living in a city that can do that yeah there's definitely a feeling which i think lots of people have kind of uh, talked about it. it's just that it's it's not quite a city but it's bigger than a town it's kind of somewhere in between where like you get to know people as people it's not just like here's another business doing their business thing yeah yeah and i and, and you know from the university has been a huge part of that for me too i mean having a really top notch university in the town makes such a difference is i mean not only obviously the academics and the institution itself but the students it's just great kind of you know, to have those young minds on mm. tap so if people want to find out a bit more about you where can they go well um i the, the main website i suppose is is still www.kma.co.uk which is really the kind of website that i use for the work that talks about audience and performance and you know the this sort of triangulation i was talking about earlier of, of, of that relationship between audience and performer and thing um, and People We Love is on there. Um, and then Viridian is um, Viridian, V-I-R-I-D-I-A-N-F-X.co.uk, um, where there's a show reel and it just gives an example of the kind of work that the company does. Um, so between those two places, you probably get a kind of pretty broad overview. Amazing. Well, thanks for being on the podcast. Well, no, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. <laughs>